king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know it. Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. I heard, I heard uh, uh, the white this morning when I walked into the Sunday school room down there against the Cubs. He was talking about how great this day is, and, and it is, because it's Resurrection Sunday. Amen. That, that's, that's the hope that we have. That's, this day, this day that we have today is a day of hope. It's a day that, that Christ ushered in that word, that word, hope. And as we continue in the, the sermon series that we're in, today's the final day on that. And he's the king. He's the king. And, and with that said, there's, there's a couple things that we need to understand. Mainly one thing we need to understand. We have hope. We have hope. Now that word, that word hope, the, there's actually a lot of different ways to understand or see that word. Now if you, if you take... The worldview of that hope, the worldview of that hope is, is more of an of, uh, uh, of a, uh, uh, expectation, uh, more of an ex almost like a wish, like I wish this would be. See, that's not the hope we have, right. but it's the, the it's the view of the world. Think about it. Uh, for example, today, kids all across our nation, and, and right here this morning, uh, with the kids that we have this morning, they woke up to Easter. And, I, and as ben, ben helped us put the Easter bags together for the kids and, and, and kids, happy Easter. And that, and that was, uh, we were so glad to do that for y'all because the kids are so important to us, first of all. Uh, but as we put those together, I thought back to when my boys were young. And we would go and get the pre-made Easter baskets from the store. And they looked so good. They, they look so great. They, you know, some of the ones that we have, they either have the basketball and the football in it. Uh, and they had a couple pieces of candy around it. And, and we gave it to the boys, and they had so much expectations for that basket. But I kid you not, it, and it broke my heart every time they opened one, they empty. They hollow. All the, all, it looks great, uh, but the basket itself, you would think would be full of candy and all these other goodies. They ain't. They, they empty. Uh, but that, that explains the world's expectation in a perfect way. Because think about it. Uh, the way the world thinks with the expectation, they, they, they would say that, you know what, I have great expectations for people. But I don't know, if you've been around people long enough, you know that they'll let you down. Sooner or later, they will let you down. And then, you know, we also have expectation for our government. We expect them to govern, and not just govern, but govern the right way. And what happens, those expectations... Kind of hollow. It's it's kind of it's empty. And then, of course, one of the biggest things that we deal with is the expectation of money. I mean, every one of us, at one time or another, uh, we work or we're working towards work. And, and why do we work? We work so we can get money. And it looks so good on the outside. But I'm going to tell you, money, it's empty. It really is. So we have these great expectations. For all these things in our lives, but they're empty. They're hollow on the inside. See, this is not the hope that we're talking about today. Right. This is not the hope that we're talking about today. It's the hope that we're talking about today is the hope that we have in our king. He's the king. That's, that's where my hope is. See, that hope, that hope that we're talking about is more of a confidence. Like, I know. That I have my hope in Christ because of what Christ did for me. That's my hope. It's more of a confidence. A confidence that is given to us through Christ. And we're going to see that come alive in front of us today. Uh, and, and with that we know without any uncertainty, without any hesitation, we know that Jesus is with us. That's my hope. 
And we actually see a, a picture of this hope. It's actually in the Old Testament. This isn't our scripture today, so you don't have to turn there. Uh, but I will have it up on the screen. Uh, it's in Ezekiel 36, 36. It's from the Old Testament. Uh, when, when the people were needing something. They were needing a little hope. And this is what, this is what God says in Ezekiel 36, 36. Then the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. Amen. That's the hope that we have. That's the hope that, that the, the people of Israel needed because, see, the people of Israel at the time... I, this is a sermon itself. I'm going to try not to, but this is a sermon itself. The people of Israel, they were, they were, they were, they were sent through the ringer. Like if it could go bad, it went bad. Everything was going wrong. They had they had grief in their life. They had fear in their life. They had doubt in their life. And really, that's all Israel knew for a long time. But they had hope because God here says, He will rebuild. And how does he say that? I will do it. I will do it. That's the hope that Israel needed. That's the hope that we need today. I will do it. See, we, they had hope in him as we have hope in him. Now, I'm going to warn you. This hope thing is it, going to be tough because, because that hope that you have is going to be tested as you go through life does. It's going to happen. Uh, and as you walk through life, you're going to, it's going to feel like sometimes that you're hit upside the head. And then when you think that's it, it's coming on the other side, hitting you upside the head from the other direction. And then at times it's going to feel like it's squashing down. Sometimes it's going to feel like you've been run over by a school bus, Donnie. <laughs> Not that Donnie would ever run anybody over the school bus, but, <laughs> but that's, what he would, that, that's what our life feels like sometimes. And so we need this hope. And that's what, as we move through our scripture today, our scripture is going to be in John, John chapter 20. Uh, uh, John chapter 20, verses 11, 11 through 31. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we're not going to read the whole thing. We're going to jump around a little bit like we did last week. Uh, so I'm going to keep the end back there busy, uh, going between my slides. Uh, but we're going to jump around a little bit. But I have a few things in the scripture that we're going to look at uh, in our brief time this morning. We have a few things. Uh, for us to consider about this thing we call hope. But not just hope, but the hope that we have in our king. Amen. Because after all, don't forget the series that we're in. He's the king. He's the king. So one of the, as we get started, we're going to be in John chapter 20, starting in verse 11. But before I read it, one of the, one of the hardest things for us is to have hope in the midst of grief. When, when the tears flow because of loss, when the tear flows because of hurt we have in our hearts, hope is hard to see sometimes. See, that hope kind of gets blurred out sometimes with all the tears. And we need to see that as we start reading this morning. But here's, here's your encouragement. There is hope in grief. Hope and grief, that's the first thing we're going to consider today. In John chapter 20, starting in verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Now she had, let's stop here just for a second. She's not even went into the tomb yet, and she's already crying. But, but why is she crying? Well, let's go back in history a little bit to last week. We preached... Uh, uh, Bill gave me the opportunity, and pray for Bill, by the way, but Bill's given me the opportunity to fin out, finish out his sermon series. I, I appreciate him for letting me do that and having, having uh, uh, courage uh, to let me do that and trusting me enough to do that. But last week we talked about Palm Sunday where Christ comes into the city. And everybody is, is yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us, is what they were crying for last week. And then she gets to see... Christ go to the cross. But even more than that, we know what happened right before the cross with him being beat, with him being whipped, and all this. So, yeah, she's crying. She's hurt. She has loss in her life. So, yeah, she has grief. 
And they continue it. As she wept, she bent down over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. We need to stop there. We've got other scriptures over, but we need to stop here because, because can you not hear the panic in her voice? I mean, does not, is that not what grief does to us sometimes? Puts us in a state of panic. And can you hear it in her voice? Uh, I, I can't even, I'm not even going to begin to, to try to understand and fathom the grief that she's feeling right now. I can't. The, the closest that I can with that whole panic thing, uh, uh, it, it's, and it really it's not even the same galaxy that Mary's feeling right here. Uh, but I remember back, you know, we were talking about the boys being young earlier. But when both of them were young, at different times, of course, um, we would go to the store, and you'd be looking at something or other, and all of a sudden, you look away, and then you look back, and the kids, Blake and Ben, are gone. And they thought it was a great idea to hide in the clothes rack. But the panic come on the dad a little bit, because, you know, they're gone, first of all. Uh, and then I'm thinking, okay, so how is Heather actually going to kill me? It's going to be fast. <laughs> it's gonna be, I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. Uh, but panic, the panic sunk in because <coughs> they were gone. Because I thought that I've done lost one of my boys. Now again, this isn't this isn't nowhere near where Mary is here. But Mary's feeling that panic feeling right now. She's in full panic mode here. Because the crucified body of Jesus is gone. He's gone. Now don't miss this. The body. The body's gone. So, so in her mind, what is, she, what is she seeing? What is she thinking? First of all, you've got to think of the body that she's talking about. The body that was beat. The body that was whipped. The body that was spit. The body that was hung on the cross. And we know the story of how he was hung on the cross with nails through his hands and his feet. That's the body. That body that died on that cross. That body that was crucified. That's what she's expecting to see here. It's gone. It's gone. And then we read on in verse 14. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus say. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him. I'll get him. Tell me where he is. I'll go get him myself. You can hear the panic in her voice. But then, he shows her. He shows her. In verse 16, it says, Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Arabic, Rabbi, Master, Teacher. Mary was so grief stricken. First of all, Jesus was crucified. And now she goes to finish preparing the body. Because remember, because of the Sabbath, they had to go back later uh, with, the, with the spices and everything to prepare the body. But it's gone. The heartache that Mary was seeing in others as well. You know, if you read the other Gospels, you see that there's others there. Uh, but this is, this is focused on Mary right here. The heartache that she felt. It was causing real physical pain. Because you know grief does that. Grief causes real physical pain. It causes real psychological pain. <coughs> it, it's real. It's real as real can be. And it's a real emotional pain that she was feeling here. Be, see, grief does that to us. There's no doubt if you've never been in that, you will. 
if you've never, if you've never experienced that kind of grief, gosh, I hate to be in the bearer of bad news, but you will. And you're going to understand when I say that the pain is real because it is. There's good news in, in, in verse 16. If you're a follower of Christ this morning, in verse 16, this verse is for you. Jesus said to her, Mary, do me a favor. Put your name in there instead of Mary. Because you see, he knows your name. Good. See, that's the hope that we have in grief. He knows your name. He knows what you're going through. He knows that, that real pain that you're going through as you walk through grief. He knows that pain because he knows your name. And if he knows your name, then you have the same hope that Mary has here. You have that same hope right now. Right here. You have that hope. So here's the question. So if I'm a follower of Christ, why, and not just why, but will there still be grief in all? Absolutely. Yes. It's going to happen. It will. But we have hope in those times. Now I'll go ahead and tell you, I'll forewarn you ahead of time. Sometimes that grief will turn into fear. But there's hope in fear as well. See, that's the next part that we're going to look at. That that hope in fear. Uh, and and, and I, I'll be honest with you, there in my life. Uh, there's not many other things that cause the anxiety levels to spike like fear causes. It, it'll do it. Fear, fear will stop us in our tracks. It, it really will. And, and, it, and, and it's a wide variety of fears that we have in our life. Uh, like a, a fear of, of what's in front of us. Like what's to come in a few hours. What's to come in a few days. What's to come in a few weeks, months, years. And, and sometimes we're, we're gripped by that fear and, and, and we're so worried about tomorrow because we fear tomorrow so much. But the, see, there's another kind. There's also a fear of what's behind us because we know that that, that stuff that's behind us sooner or later is going to catch up to us. And so we fear that as well. And then we also fear the unknown. Like that's one of the worst fears for me is the unknown. Like I want to know what's going to happen. Hey, even if it's bad, hey, just let me know. But no, nah, that's not the way it always works. Sometimes we have that fear of the unknown. And then for some of us, maybe it's the fear of medical issues. Whether it's medical issues of you or medical issues of a family member, a loved one. It just, it, it grips you. Like, I can't do nothing. And, and I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm fearful of this. And of course, one of the greatest fears that we have. Is the fear of loss. Like how do I function without this person? How can I do this? But those fears come up in practice. It just does. And isn't it, isn't it amazing how grief can turn into that fear? And that's right where we are when we look at scripture. In, in, in John chapter 20 verses 19 first. On that evening of the first day of the week. When the disciples were together. With the doors locked. Here the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them, saying, Peace be with you. Amen. Peace be with you. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I've read that scripture over and over and over, over the years, and I don't know why, but that whole part of the doors being locked, i read over. And it's like, okay, the doors are locked. Big deal. All right, it's a big deal. It's a big deal that the doors were locked. It, it makes sense because in our own lives, don't we lock down when there's fears in front of us? Not a physical lock doors. Like, you know, I think some people probably will go in a door and lock the door when things get bad. But, but I'm talking about you yourself lock down when you're facing fears in your life. Like when there is hurt in your life, you lock everything else down. Because you don't want to be hurt no more. Because hurt hurts. So we lock everything down or when we're scared. We were talking uh, to Mason this morning. You know, when the chicken house caught on fire, I was like, were you scared, Mason? Yeah. 
Hey, fear locks us down sometimes. When you're afraid of something, you're going to lock things down. You're not going to want to go any further. When you get worried about things, you start to fear and you lock things down. You lock your emotions down. You lock your relationships with other people down. You lock your relationship with God down because you're so worried. Or maybe we think that the world is after us. We're so worried about the world crashing in on us. Uh, we lock it down. We try to lock everything down. That's what we do when, we, when we're when we in our, those fear times that turn into uh, that grief when it turns into fear. We just lock it down. That's what we do. We're so good at that. But in verse 20, verse 20, after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. What does this show us here? Locked doors? That's no barrier for a king. Amen. That's right. That's no barrier for a king that has already defeated death. You think you lock him down, something other is going to stop him? No. See, that's the hope that we have. That he can break through even our locks that we try to lock up. He still breaks through those things. Because he's unlocked. That's what he done. That the very thing that the disciples here needed and what they were lacking was the very thing that Jesus was offering here. Notice what Jesus said. He came and he said, Peace be with you. He was there to give them peace. And even more than that, Christ was there to give them hope. Even behind their locked door. He's there to give them hope. How do I? How is this? How do I? How do I do this? Like, like, like when, when grief and that fear, when, it, when, when it feels, I'm not trying to lock things down, but it's locking me down. How, how do I deal with this? At, at the moment that you're tripped up, that you're bound, uh, that you're gripped with fear, we need to remember Jesus is. Right now, right here, Jesus is here, and he comes with a couple things. Peace and hope. Peace and hope. Don't try to lock the doors. Don't try to lock those doors when fear tries to bind you up. Hey, the hope is in him. So the hope is in him. And believe me when I say, I, 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 don't, I don't understand when we're faced with fear and that grief and then all of a sudden doubt starts to creep in. See, that's the next progression that we go through here. When grief turns into fear and then that fear turns into doubt. But I'm here to tell you again, there's hope even in the doubt. There's hope in the doubt. John 20, 24, and 25. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Mm -hmm. Like they have, they have good news. Like, like, like he should grab on to this. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So here's the rub. Here's the rub in verse 20 and 25. See, we all have a bit of that Thomas in our lives. See, we're so quick to throw Thomas under the bus. Thomas the doubter. You know, we've all heard that story. That's me. I've been where Thomas is. And I'll be honest with you, uh, when grief and, and, and fear are in full force in your life, we start to doubt. We will. We do. We have. I can't get out of this. Like I start to doubt myself. Like how will I ever get out of this predicament? How can I move on from this? Are we saying that's never going to happen? I'm never going to be able to reach that. I'm never going to be able to go there. Do this. Start to doubt things. There's no way that this is ever going to happen. 
There's no how this is ever going to happen. And then, of course, one of the favorite lines of the world that's around us, when doubt sinks in, I have to see it to believe it. One of the biggest lies you've ever been told. I have to see it to believe it. <coughs> have you ever said this? Or something like any of one of these? Thomas did. Thomas did right here. But that doubt makes a turn. It makes a turn in, in John uh, 26 and 27, then we're at 28 and 29 here in a moment. But in, in 26 and 27, it says a week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them this time. <coughs> He's there with them this time. Uh, and through the door, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, like, he, like I can see Jesus turning. There's Thomas. Let me go ahead, Thomas, let's, let's talk. Let, let's go ahead and talk about this. And he says to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. And here it is. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus just called Thomas out here. And he, and he says, hey, look. Look. Feel. Feel the scarred hands. Can you see me, Thomas? Like that's, that's what Jesus was telling Thomas right here. Think about your own life. Think about, and think back. Think back in your, in your history. Has God ever moved in your life in such a way that you knew it was God? Like I can specifically go back to moments in my life, even before I knew Christ, where he moved in my life. Because I'd done some stupid things when I was young. And then even put to the point where, where, where Heather shared the gospel with me. And when we got married and when we had kids and everything that we've been through, I have seen God move in miraculous ways in our like I've seen that happen. But then grief, fear, and doubt comes into your life. And not just comes into your life, but because sometimes that grief and that fear and that doubt, sometimes they, they tiptoe in your life. Like it gradually moves into your life when you gradually okay, locking everything down. And all of a sudden, in my own life, I start to doubt. I start to doubt. And now in my own life, I've seen this, seen this come happen. Uh, because, because God has done so much for me and Heather over the years. And, and I have to stop and think, he's done so much for us over the years. Why would he not be here now? That's right. That's right. Because you see, that's where my hope is. My hope isn't in me. My hope's in him, the one that I can look. Remember, this is what he told Thomas. I can look. I can look around and see him everywhere. I can feel. I can feel God in my life. I can feel what Christ has done. Because I can see it. I can see it all the way around. But that last part of verse 27. See, this is the part that gets me. Stop doubting and believe. Amen. Stop doubting and believe. And see those words, those words get to me and they got to Thomas here because in verse 28 and 29, Thomas, Thomas starts to rethink things. Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Amen. See that touch that Thomas did there? That, that time that Thomas doubted and that touch, that touch of the resurrected Jesus, let me go and tell you what that touch was. It was for every one of the doubters in here. That's why he touched Christ in. Because, because Christ knew that there would be others that would doubt. And that's why he says they're blessed are those who have not seen it yet. Believe. See, that's a, 
That's a powerful truth for us today. As we go through life, that's a powerful truth for us. As we're here on Easter Sunday morning, that's a powerful truth that we need to understand. The world we live in today says, hey, I will believe it when I see it. The world would say, the Bible that I have in my hand right here, it's old. It's out of date. That, that doesn't apply to our lives today. And then they might say, hey, I don't see God standing beside you. I don't see Christ beside you. There's, there's no God. There's no Christ. How can a dead person defeat death? I mean, that's, that's what the scientific world would say. You can't defeat death. And even more than that, how can a dead Christ do anything for you today? That's what the world would say. And so my answer, as your youth pastor, how much time you got? How much time you got? Because I got a story for you. I got a story for you. Uh, because, because, see, Tracy is blessed. Without a shadow of a doubt, God has blessed me. And see, I can also tell you that I have faith. I have faith even though I don't see him right here, just like he said in the scripture. I know he is right here. Amen. Because I can see and feel and fear him. I have faith. And then also I can tell them that, you know what, you're talking about that, that, that he died, but I have proof that he lived, that he rose again. Because it just doesn't say it in this Bible right here. It says it in an unbiblical text as well. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. It's more that it, it happened. There's, not a, there's no shadow of a doubt it happened that he rose from the tomb. And not only that, let me tell you about the real relationship I have. Because that's what it is. It's a real relationship mm -hmm. that I have with Christ. And then most of all, let me tell you about the hope I got. That's how I'd answer the world when they say, no, nah, I got to see it and believe it. No. Nah. I have hope. I have hope. And all of this to say that I have hope in his death. See, that's, that's, that's the starting point for our hope is his death because he had to die. He had to die so he can raise again to defeat death and to wipe away our sin. So yeah, there's hope in death. Absolutely, hope in death. And we see this in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 as we get ready to finish up. In verse 30 it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these, these words, these words that I've read to you this morning, these words are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Amen. Amen. That's the hope. That's the hope I have. These verses tell us that, that Jesus did so much more that's not even written down. He did so much more, but this scripture is written to us specifically. That's why it's so specific to Mary here, because it's so specific to us tonight. It is written to you and to me. So we would believe. So that we would believe in Christ. So here's the thing about believing in that it tells us in verse 31. We have life in his name. It says it right there. This isn't just youth pastor throwing some words out at you. This is in the scripture. Life in the, We have life in his name. We have peace in his name. And even more than that, we have hope in his name. And see, that's not just a once in a while thing. That's not just something that we have on Sundays when we come. That's not just something we have on, on Easter Sunday when we come in. But see, that hope that we have, it's a life thing. It's an entire life thing. Mondays, they were never good anyway. But we have hope. Tuesday, 
We talked about it before. Tuesday, most ordinary day of the week. Uh -uh. We have hope. Wednesday, everybody calls it the hump day. Uh, if I just get past Wednesday, hey, no, it's not just getting by. No, we have hope on Wednesdays. Thursdays, when everything falls apart in your life, you have hope. Friday just drags by. Like, please get me through the week so I can have a week. But even that, hey, you have hope. When Saturday goes by so fast, like there's not enough time in Saturdays. I'm going to tell you that there never is. We have hope. And Sundays, when it seems like a blur, because you're already starting to prepare for Monday, Sundays we have hope. Every second, of every minute, we have hope. Every day of every week of every month of every year, we have hope. We have hope through grief. We have hope through fear. We have hope through the doubts in our life. Start believing. Do you believe that this morning? Because that's, 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 you know, we talked about Christ pointing right at Thomas when he was doubting. Christ is pointing right at you this morning. Do you have that hope in your heart? Do you have that? Do you believe in that hope? And not just, just expectations of hope, but a confidence in that hope. Do you have that today? The king's resurrection means hope for us. He's the king. See, we have hope in that. But not just because he lives, but we can live. We can live also in that hope. No matter what the circumstances we face, we can have that hope. Through grief, we can have that hope. And, 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 and I assure you, I might not know what you're going through right now. The grief that you have in your heart right now, I, I, I don't know what you're going through. But he does. I can have confidence in that. And he can give you hope. I don't know what you're worried about today, what you're fearing today, because it's probably something different for every one of us, but I can tell you with confidence that we can have hope in those fears. That's right. Those doubts you have, every one of us have those doubts. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. You have doubts. And I'm here to tell you today, and even through those doubts, we have hope because of his death and then because he rose again. And he stood in front of me and he said, believe. Believe. 